We are making a disk sender for our workshop that we started equipping with tools built on a CNC router. And we still have a long way to go to turn this room into a functional woodworking workshop. Till now we have built only a router table and a workbench. The disk sender isn't a priority when starting a workshop, however it's gonna be essential when building features for our next project. Since we are making most of the tools for the workshop ourselves, the first thing I have to do is design the disk sender. Developing relatively complex projects like this can be overwhelming. So what I like to do is take the project apart and do the design one section at a time. Most disk senders consist of five components, an axis with a motor, a disc with a sandpaper on it, a frame that holds the axis in place, a body that covers the sandpaper disc and a work surface. When breaking the project apart in this manner, it feels more achievable. So after a couple of hours of designing, I came up with something like this. Our disc sander will be powered by cordless power drill. It has an easy to remove protective cover, changeable sandpaper disc and adjustable work surface. After the design was ready, it was time to prepare the project for the CNC operations. I had these offcuts in my workshop from a project I did for a client. The material was perfect for the project, however, there were two problems. All of them had different thicknesses and the shapes were odd as well. To solve the problem of different material thicknesses, I added some screw holes to the design. That will help ensure that the joints don't come apart when working on the disc sander. When it came to dealing with the issue of odd shapes, at first I had the idea of cutting the offcuts in rectangular shapes, but there would be too much wasted material. So to use the offcuts as efficiently as possible, I decided to measure the length of each offcut, write it down on the workpiece and take a photo of each plywood piece. While taking the photos, the camera had to be perpendicular to the floor. This way we got a precise outline of the workpiece. Then I uploaded the picture into Fusion 360 and scaled it according to the measurements we made earlier. This allowed me to place all of the disc sander components on the oddly shaped material in the most efficient way. After nesting the components, I added the necessary toolpaths and we were ready for the CNC operations. To be honest, the first sheet was stressful to cut. I wasn't 100% sure if all the components would fit in the sheet. I mean, they should, but you never know. So I was paying close attention to what was happening on the CNC table. After the first sheet I got comfortable with my out of the box nesting approach and cut all of the other sheets. After the CNC operations I had to remove the support tabs. For one of the sheets the outline cuts didn't go all the way through. Since I flipped the sheet to the other side when removing the support tabs I had to use light to locate the outline of the components. While removing the rest of the support tabs, I was wondering why didn't I listen to Tony Richmond's advice he left in the comments of the workbench video. He recommended cutting all of the components using compression bit. It leaves the wood chips in the cutting groove and they keep the components in place during the operations. It means I could have saved some time on removing the support tabs. I will try this approach when building our next project. If you would like to see how this approach works, subscribe to this channel. I use the chamfer bit to trim the components to get rid of the sharp edges. When using a router table, it's recommended to keep your digits as far away from the blade as possible. The minimum distance is at least 10 cm or 4 inches from the router bit. I know some of the components I worked on were too small to be safely trimmed on the router table. It puts my fingers in danger and it wasn't clever of me to do it. I don't recommend you do what I just did there. But if you do decide to risk your fingers, be mindful of all your movements and hold the workpiece firmly. If not, the workpiece can be thrown away from the blade just like this and there is unnecessary risk to injure your fingers and your hands. Safer approach for small components is using a mallet and chisel to remove the support tabs and sandpaper to smoothen the edges. It may take longer, but it's way safer. Alright, enough with the safety lessons. The components are almost ready for the assembling. I just have to glue the sandpaper to the plywood disc. For that I used PVA wood glue and kettlebell weights. Alright, now we wait. Just kidding. While the glue is drying we have to make a new mallet. I broke the one I had while building the workbench. To make one all we have to do is cut the mallet components on the CNC, trim a couple of edges and glue the parts together. For positioning the components, I used 8mm dowels at the corners of the mallet head and on the handle of the mallet. 
and then I threw the old mallet in the furnace. Alright, now we have everything that we need to assemble the disc sander. As the first thing, I hammered bearings between the frame components. This will ensure that they stay in place while we are working on the disc sander. And to make sure the little axis holder stays in place, I glued small covers on both sides. I used a drill bit slightly smaller than the original hole to ensure that the holes are concentric. Then I assembled the main frame. When the first components were in place, I added some screws from the bottom of the base panel. After installing the back wall, I inlaid hex nuts in the side components. These will be necessary when attaching the work surface. When that was done, I attached the side parts on the frame we had already built. And then I added a bunch of screws. I think it was a good call to integrate them into this project since the difference of the material thickness did affect the tightness of some of the joints. Next, I installed the bottom floor component. After that, I added hex screw to the disc panel. This will serve as the axis of the disc sander. I had to make sure that the screw head is flush with the surface and that the screw itself is perpendicular to the disc. Everything was good, so I added the disc to the frame. It took some time, but it worked out. Before attaching the power drill to the axis, I had to assemble the drill positioning components. Then I hammered hex nuts into the star knobs. After the positioning guides were in place, I attached four dowels at the main panel. The distance between the dowels is the same as the ones on our workbench. This will simplify attaching the disc sander to our table. Next, I attached the drill to the axis and gave it a spin. Everything worked nicely, so I installed four small dowels in the base disc. These will be useful for positioning the sandpaper disc. I added some screws to ensure the sandpaper did stay in place while spinning. After that, I attached the front wall. Then it was time to assemble the work table. To attach it to the frame, I made these star knob screws. When the table was in place, I checked if the angle between the disc and the work surface is 90 degrees, and it seemed perfect. At this point, the only thing left to build was the top safety cover. And after hours of assembling, the disc sander was complete. And it was time to test it out, so I tied the zip tie around the power drill's button, grabbed a small piece of plywood and went to the disc sander. But then I noticed sandpaper rotation seemed to be eccentric. It wasn't good, but I still had to give it a try. And it wasn't working as it was supposed to. So after a short troubleshooting, I realized that the base disc wasn't fixed in place by anything. The easiest solution would be to add a nut and a washer behind the disc to hold it in place. The problem was the screw that I was using for the axis didn't have a full thread. It meant that I had to replace the axis with another screw. And I couldn't find one in my local hardware store. So I purchased an M10 thread rod and replaced the axis. After installing the washer and nut I noticed significant improvement. However, it still wasn't good enough. So I had to add a washer in front of the disc. And it didn't help much. I was running out of ideas. 
However, at this point I was curious if the result would be better if we used bigger washers. So I decided to test it out and made a small plywood panel with a screw nut inlay. It would serve as a bolt and a washer. To help me install the panel I made a small plywood wrench and this worked. I mean there still was a small wobble when the disc was spinning but it was way better. So I reassembled the disc sander and tested it out. And it was quite an improvement. So I decided to change the sandpaper disc to a rougher one. To do so I had to remove the work surface, the top cover and the front panel. Then I could remove the 120 grit sandpaper disc and replace it with an 80 grit disc. To test it out I wanted to smoothen our mallet head that had screw marks left on it from when we hammered the axis screw. And it worked. So we now have a disc sander in our workshop and we are ready for our next project. That's it for today. Stay creative and I'll see you next time.